Hello and welcome to Worldview. This is finally episode 100. And we would really like to thank you, the viewer and the reader of The Hindu, for joining this journey with us for more than two years now. Each week at Worldview, we take a different subject for discussion on how international developments have shaped Indian foreign policy. And Worldview has been shaped by your feedback each week. But for our special 100th episode, we actually asked you to decide what we would speak about. And thank you for sending in all your questions. So I'm going to get right to them and try to answer them as best we can. Uh, to begin with, there's a question from Yashwant Kumar who asks, he'd be interested to learn about the role of various institutions like the MEA, the PMO and the NSC in shaping India's foreign policy and how has diplomacy changed in the age of social media? Uh, Yashwant, it's a very, very big question. So I'm going to answer a part of it and try to tackle the question on social media in a future episode of Worldview. According to the format, really, the Ministry of External Affairs is the organ that carries out India's foreign policy. So all Indian diplomats, both in Delhi and at about 125 embassies, 30 consulates worldwide, report to the MEA. However, foreign policy is of course formed by a number of different ministries and the Prime Minister's office has always taken a very big role in decision making. Uh, the National Security uh, Council Secretariat, the NSC, is a part of the PMO. It focuses very much on security issues, but many of these bleed in. And that's why you see NSA uh, Ajit Doval also traveling perhaps as much sometimes uh, internationally as we do see external affairs minister S.J. Shankar going as well, uh, whether it is to the US, to uh, the UK, to Russia uh, and to other countries. All right, so the next question comes from Mohammad Farooq Elias. Uh, he says, seeing the realist approach of international relations, was it necessary for India to do away with Nehruvian foreign policy and bring forth the Modi era of foreign policy? And if so, why? So Farooq, I would say, while it's easy to bracket foreign policy according to the nation's leader at the time, because that is the most visible face of any policy, the fact is India has not had a single policy, but an evolution of policy. So when you say uh, the Nehruvian foreign policy, that is, uh, is a policy that has continued to evolve over over the decades, over the years, all the way to what we see today under Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Uh, on an upcoming episode of Worldview, actually, I'm going to try and explain this evolution in greater depth, that how it has gone uh, from a more perhaps idealistic approach to a realistic approach to a real politic approach to what is seen today more as a transactional approach. What do each of these terms mean? Even so, and as I said, there has been this change uh, that has occurred across the decades. Uh, even so, it might surprise you to know that there are some constants. In a special address in 1946 to the Constituent Assembly, Mr. Nehru actually spelt out Indian foreign policy. And at the time, he put out eight or nine different descriptors for what India's, independent India's foreign policy would be. Uh, and what might surprise uh, you and other viewers is to know that he listed things like non-alignment, also anti-colonialism. He also listed one world or Vasudeva Kutumbakam as part of the policy and these still resonate. Uh, the next question is from Jaydeep Gadvi. He says, as the Prime Minister rightly pointed out, multilateralism is in crisis. So is India looking towards a lot of substitutions such as BIMSTEC in place of SARC, G20 and Global South in place of the UN? And how well do you think it's going to work? Great question, Jaydeep. Uh, the next few years will be key to finding out what happens. But it is clear that the global power structure, as it was envisioned in 1945 for the United Nations, cannot continue to be as relevant in the 2020s. In any case, given deepening polarizations between the UN Security Council players, uh, US, UK, France on one side, Russia, China on the other, and, and these are broader than they have been perhaps at any time since the 1940s. Um, the UN Security Council as a result has become unworkable, and this is something we've seen in the Ukraine war. The G20 is not only a larger discuss, uh, discussion forum, it is a forum that brings in the developing world. Even so, it has no teeth. It's essentially an economic forum and it can't really enforce any of these things. So one may not be able to replace another. I also think, for example, that BIMSTEC cannot 
um, replace SARC as India's neighborhood itself. Despite all the problems India has with Pakistan, India's neighborhood is a geographic reality. I've written about this in the past. It cannot be uh, uh, redefined in only one direction and say India will only look east when it comes to its neighborhood policy. So somewhere there will have to be some kind of compromises. I don't think one organization can really replace the next. Uh, Owais has a question, is there now any chance for India to still be neutral in the contemporary world politics when its talks are really everywhere, especially after I2U2 as well as G20? I'm not quite sure uh, all of uh, that you mean over here, but there's another question here from Anil who says, does India's strategy on foreign policy, national interest and, ba and the balancing act, will this have any impact on India's dreams to get a chair of the UN uh, Security Council, the top uh, the top uh, stage, he calls it over there. Uh, another question that says, would India be able to maintain its strategic autonomy in foreign policy and multi-alignment in the future? Uh, as it is evident that the Western world is united against Russia, India has enhanced its partnership with the West. This is from Sikandar Ali. So thanks everyone for all these questions. I'm trying to actually just put them together. Sikandar also asked, what is the future of Russia India ties. Um, so to your questions, always to Anil and Sikandar, India's middle path stand has been given many names over the decades. It was called non-alignment, it was called neutrality, it's been called multi-alignment, talk of multipolarity, strategic autonomy. At the core of all of this is a decision that India will not submit to being an alliance partner of any global power. It's not about taking sides so much as India's position Maybe on one side or the other side, but its position is squarely not as an alliance partner with any global power. This is the position that has given India the flexibility it needs to maintain a foreign policy that is in the best interests of a country that needs economic development above all else in a sense. Uh, Anil, the UN Security Council reform has been promised for decades, but it has really actually barely moved. Since 2009, India has had the public backing of at least four of the five UN Security Council members for its inclusion. The one, uh, the one that hasn't said it expressly is China, but rather than a seat being in the pipeline, it has remained a pipe dream. I am not sure if India's foreign policy choices as a result will be a real factor in the final decision which is really about where the global balance of power lies. To your specific question, Sikandar, what is the future of India-Russia ties? I would say, well, there has been a consistent decline in new defense purchases from Russia since 2012. There is also an increase in bilateral trade, particularly boosted by oil purchases uh, last year. Uh, Russia's importance as a strategic partner in the recent past has also grown when it comes to Afghanistan. So given India's continental constraints, borders with China and Pakistan, both bitter rivals, Russia and Central Asia will remain important partners uh, for India for the foreseeable future. Okay, so a question on G20 from Harsh Seth. To what extent and how can India use its G20 presidency to bring Russia and the Western world on the same table? Tall order really there. Also a question of, on a similar vein from Siddhant Shirsagar, who says, how can Indian foreign policy play a role in, in peace negotiations between Russia and Ukraine conflict during or before the G20 leaders meeting? So Siddhant and Harsh, this is a question on many people's mind. And I would say the answer is the time is now and the clock is ticking. India has an opportunity and an obligation as the G20 president and the summit in September to ensure that a common ground for negotiations is found over the Russia-Ukraine conflict, uh, given particularly the failure of G20 ministerials thus far over the issue, the finance minister's meeting and the foreign minister's meeting. Remember, there will be another finance minister's meeting, the second one of finance ministers and central bank governors in Washington, actually in the second week of April. Now, last year, Indonesian President Jokowi was able to straddle the two sides. He made visits to Kyiv, in fact, also Moscow. He met some success when the Grain Deal Initiative was announced. This week, it does seem, or next week, it does seem that Chinese President Xi Jinping will try also to reach out to both sides. Now, if Prime Minister Modi does the same, reaches out to both Kyiv and Moscow, tries to bring uh, the West and Russia, China back on the same page, you can be sure we'll cover it here on Worldview. It's certainly a difficult task, but if anyone, India is in the right position to take up that challenge. Uh, a question now from SP, which is a very specific question, so I hope I've understood it right. 
The currency swap policy between India and Russia to bypass US dollars has boomeranged, he says, because India's trade deficit with India has ballooned 16 times over since war broke out. Now, of course, this is also due to the fact that India's imports from Russia have climbed up due to a you know, huge increase from about 40,000 barrels per day to about um, 1.8 million barrels per day of Russian oil. Um, so the question he's asking is, has this policy failed because of India's uh, decision to buy crude from Russia, surpassing Saudi Arabia and Iraq? Um, now, my answer really would be, I think US sanctions have more to do with India's policy right now. So I, I'm not sure uh, if it is just simply about India's obsession to buy um, oil at this point. India is doing what it can and what it feels is in its best interest. That's something the government has said again and again. But obviously, US impending sanctions do play a role. India's decision to increase oil uh, has not triggered sanctions yet. Any attempt to circumvent sanctions through payments, uh, not just for oil, but also defense purchases, could become that much more difficult. And that's been the US position. Remember, in 2018, uh, India bowed to the US and cancelled its p oil purchases from Iran. Uh, and that's one of the big reasons also why India has decided in this case that it will not give in to the sanctions or at least the requests from countries uh, at this moment to uh, decrease its oil purchases from Russia. I hope that does answer your question. There's a larger question there about how the currency swap arrangements or what is actually just trading in national currencies will play out. India is discussing it with Russia. Officials are talking between the central banks. We also understand it's a part of the BRICS payment mechanism and there's going to be a BRICS summit in August this year where you might hear more about that. A uh, question from Ashutosh, what are the implications for India in the recent China-mediated Saudi Arabia-Iran rapprochement and what policy should India follow in West Asia dynamics? Very important question, uh, Suryansh. Uh, and, uh, and there is a question actually, sorry, from Suryansh as well. The first one was from Ashutosh. Uh, Suryansh asks, what should be India's approach in dealing with the Indo-Pacific and the Middle East region at a time when China is rapidly advancing its steps towards becoming a global power and a common voice for global south, I presume he means especially in West Asia, thus countering India's interests. So these are very, very big questions and I hope I can answer them in future uh, worldviews, Ashutosh and Suryanj. Um, as China's um, mediation or brokerage of the Saudi-Iran deal, this is something definitely new. In fact, I, I would have discussed it on Worldview this week had it not been our hundredth. Uh, India is affected for three reasons. One, this is India's strategic neighborhood. So China is not doing something in, in say, Southeast Asia or the Far East that is not part of India's own neighborhood. This is India's strategic neighborhood. Secondly, both Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Iran are close strategic partners of India. Uh, India has close ties with both of them and remember, uh, KSA, or the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, has a $100 billion investment plan in India. That's been a, a, a big uh, factor in, in ties. Iran, of course, is where Chabahar port, the trilateral arrangement for India to circumvent Pakistan when it comes to uh, trade and is part of the INSTC all the way going to Russia. Um, so this, this is another reason why the two countries are both very important to India. What happens between them is very important and why the Ministry of External Affairs says it actually encourages all such rapprochements. Um, the third is China's decision to go public with its role uh, and to say that it plans more such peace initiatives has to be watched closely by India because India has its own tensions with China over the LAC and it's a question of which other conflicts China decides to uh, step, its, uh, step into. Um, the next question from Jairam Srinivasan, what can we do if China steps up attacks on us, like how Russia is doing with Ukraine? I'm not sure that is a military possibility, Jairam. Uh, but even so, in the broader picture of what you said, remember External Affairs Minister S.J. Shankar drew a comparison between those two conflicts in Europe and asked, why is the West not spoken up about China's aggressions along the LAC as it has over Ukraine? Uh, while I think actually the answer to it is because India itself does not want others to discuss it as much. It wants to have enough flexibility to uh, negotiate bilaterally with China. Uh, but it is also true that India's diplomatic options, three years after the PLA transgressed, 
remain limited. And remember, on worldview, we don't really talk about the military options. We're talking about the diplomatic options. So what are those options uh, after three years of this uh, uh, conflict and, uh, and of course, the, the Galwan uh, killings as well? One, to continue the bilateral negotiations, which is what the government is doing. The second would be to escalate, to take the issue to the UN. But China still has a veto at the UN Security Council. And it hasn't gone very well for India in the past when it has tried to raise things on the international sphere and got uh, other countries involved in some kind of uh, hopes for mediation. Uh, the third, India could join an alliance with Western powers, as in the Indo-Pacific, to try and contain China and put pressure on China and hopefully have it release its hold there at the LAC. Uh, but this also becomes hard uh, because while an Indo-Pacific maritime alliance with the Western powers may be possible, what happens if there is an escalation along India's 3,500 kilometer long boundary with China? Uh, so there are no easy answers to this. And I think the diplomatic means is until nothing, uh, nothing, you, you know, it is the only one that works uh, short of any kind of military operations. Um, then there's a question from Asim Malik, an interesting one. Does the rising majoritarianism in India erode its credibility as a responsible power of the global south? Asim, my answer to you is that domestic policies are really considered internal, internal matters by all countries. So hence, you seldom see issues like majoritarianism, discrimination, even casteism within the country becoming part of foreign policy negotiations. There's no doubt that there's an increase in commentary uh, about such issues. And they come up during international visits like that of recently US Secretary of State uh, Blinken or earlier Bangladeshi Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina when she spoke about the Citizenship Amendment Act. But remember, this also cuts both ways. Prime Minister Modi has raised issues of violence or vandalism at temples and other shrines with the Prime Minister of Australia very recently, Prime Minister Albanese. And the Ministry of External Affairs does take up these issues with the UK and Canada as well. However, one must remember what is not factored into the diplomatic calculus often is soft power of a country. India's soft power in particular does get damaged, where a country's image as an open, liberal, inclusive, and just power is a critical factor in how people rather than government see its global influence. To that extent, yes, India does get impacted. Uh, and then this question from Ryan Putt, how is India, how is India going to deal with the post-Taliban takeover in Afghanistan? What are India's options? Ryan, well, in a nutshell, and we have discussed this on Worldview, what we can analyze is what the government has done thus far. One, after one year of the Taliban in power, New Delhi reopened a technical mission in Kabul. But like other countries around the world, India has not recognized the regime. Two, India continues what it calls people-centric humanitarian aid to Afghanistan, but it hasn't opened the doors for a single visa, apart to, from those given to minorities from Afghanistan in uh, 2021 itself. So we've not seen any visas go out, and this is be increasingly becoming a problem. Uh, three, India is working with Central Asian countries to manage the threat of terror and drugs being exported out of Afghanistan. Uh, however, these are all tactile, if you like, not strategic moves. They're meant to limit da damage for India in the present. If Afghanistan becomes more volatile, India will have much more difficult choices to make, and we'll certainly report on them. And finally, this question coming in from L. Sri Chandrasekhar. How does our labor force spread across the globe, shape our international relations? Um, very, very interesting question uh, right at the end. Just to put things in perspective, Mr. Chandrasekhar, of more than 9 million Indian wo uh, Indians working worldwide, that's 90 lakhs. 90% are in Gulf countries. Uh, so when you do, while you do hear of India raising issues of H-1B visas or European mobility laws, restrictions uh, on services, the largest impact our, our labor force has on ties is with Gulf countries, including Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, Oman and others in the Gulf Cooperation Council. Often the issues are consular in nature and are tackled by diplomats at a local level. You don't really even hear of them. Sometimes, like in the case of the eight naval officers, former naval officers in prison in Qatar for months now, the issues impact ties a bit more. But where I see a greater space for labor force to shape international ties is the conclusion of free trade agreements with them. India is increasingly insisting 
on services and mobility issues as a part of trade in services and goods. Our partners will have to step up in terms of providing Indian labor better terms. This is the reason many European countries and others are signing mobility agreements with India. So it's to streamline the issues, ensure that there's no illegal immigration and that India takes back those citizens who have entered uh, illegally. Those are tricky, thorny issues. And remember, while there are mobility agreements, you may not actually have India being able to uh, uh, make good on them on many occasions. In many occasions, other countries are not able to have a convincing list of Indian citizens who have transgressed without legal visas. Um, also, while China was a big factor in India's decision to leave the RCEP, the Regional Cooperate, uh, Cooperative Economic Partnership, some of the trickiest negotiations before India's actual walkout from RCEP, the Indo-Pacific Trade Agreement, was actually on labor clauses. So there you can see straight away how India's concerns for its labor population worldwide really do affect its foreign policy decisions. So I hope these answers helped in some way, but please keep your questions coming in. We hope to keep answering them on Worldview and make this a regular feature. Of course, we'll be back with our regular edition of Worldview and reading recommendations from next week. Before I go, I do want to introduce you to the team behind the scenes here at Worldview who've helped put together uh, Worldview each week over the course of a hundred episodes. So there's Gayatri Menon, Renu Syriac, Abhinay Sriram, Kivli Insani, Preeti Ramamurthy, Rajeshri Das, Anjali Krishnan, Sharon Joseph, and of course our producer Kanishka Balachandran. Thanks so much to all of you. Uh, and of course now you know as the, as the viewer whom I mean when I say from the team at Worldview, thanks for watching. Do join us again.